this session today, so thank you for coming back. Um, just a reminder that next week we start with Carla Erickson's course on uh, driverless trucks and the future of labor or work. We'll see. I mean, who knows what may happen with driverless trucks? There may be no, future, no people around to do the future of work. Uh, but anyway, you can um, you can sign up. You can register for that this morning during break time with Judy. Uh, and Judy, you want to say something? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But she's out at the desk uh, during break time and will be happy to register you or you can go online, of course. So this is the point where I say, as usual, if you're using a T-coil, turn it on now. If you've got a phone that you haven't silenced yet, please do. Um, when you have a question, please ask it and I'll come around and you can speak into the microphone and give us your name first. And with that, I think we're ready to go. Okay, thank you. As with last time, please feel free to raise your hand right away if, if I'm not speaking up loudly or if I'm too loud or dropping sentences. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have one that's immediate and short at that moment, or if not, we'll be setting up some time before the break the, at uh, 1040 and then at the end to answer any kind of longer questions. Or just invite you to respond with what you think about technology or what today's discussion has made you think about. So I started off with just uh, some slides as you were sitting and settling in. Some of you may have seen them, some may not, but slides of my uh, Technology 154 <coughs> class, the evolution of technology that's kind of, that's the course from which I'm drawing a lot of this material. Um, and it was uh, students in there doing a unit on print technologies. We were studying the printing press as a really important kind of early modern technology, um, but one of the things I try to do in that class and I'm going to talk about today is really emphasize the physicality of technologies, that they're not enough to read about. It, it can be kind of almost um, alluring to just look at like Google patents and just read about steam engines or sewing machines or whatever the device is and not really experience in a tactile way that during the first session when I read that Pablo Neruda poem, where he talked about the world of beautiful things and how he wanted to touch pipes and hold uh, needles and you know just kind of really wanted to get his hands on and immerse himself in the sounds, the sights, the smells. I try to bring a little bit of that as much as I can in an academic classroom setting to studying technology. So what I have them do is uh, do a unit with Jeremy, who's in our studio art department, where they do printing with a letter press, a kind of roller press, and also you saw them there doing hand printing and doing different techniques from Asia for like rubbing prints and things like that, but literally printing, and they're kind of quite amazed at how much it's a tactile, all the senses. So one of the uh, images of uh, the students all rolling the ink out, you can tell when the ink is ready by the sound it makes, and it's this um, and it's very important to listen to that sound and to get the feel of it. It's the kind of tactile, tacit knowledge that's hard to put in a book. You have to do it hands-on, and most of what we do with technology is hands-on. Uh, most of the craft traditions in which people use tools to make things and to make living and to make art and creative um, items all involve that kind of tactile world. So I just want to give you a sense. And then the other uh, thing that we were doing was looking at the special collections. Um, they have a large group of what are called incubas. So these are books. Incuba is just Latin for cradle. So these are books that were printed in the cradle period of printing technology, so the first 50 years. So from 1450 to 1500, we have a early collection. They're also looking at some manuscripts from the medieval period to look at handwriting. But they were really careful, if you notice, examining how was the book put together, what did it feel like, touching the pages, trying to get a sense of how over the years the lettering evolved and whether it was useful and beautiful. And, um, so anyway, I just wanted to give you a sense of what we try to do in that class. Um, and if and I had my way, we try to maybe do that in here sometime too, at a limited time. And, but I really think, if you love a technology, I really think it's important if you're going to study it, understand it, to use it with your hands. Um, so that takes me to the, the first thing I wanted to start off today's um, talk about, which is a theme that we explore in my class, um, this theme about the physicality of technology. Um, and there's one author in particular, this figure, Arnold Pacey, I used one of his books, The Meaning of Technology. He was a practicing engineer and then later became a writer of 
books. Um, and this book is, to me, really amazing because he's kind of cataloged all the different ways in which sight, sound, smell, other things affect the way we use technologies, both high technologies, machines, things like that, but also everyday objects you know, we've talked about. Let me just read a quote from his book. He says, one way of explaining what this book is about, then, is to say that it describes what technology feels like to its practitioners, to the consumers of its products. And he actually looks at how people use everyday objects and how that feels. Um, and in relation to the environment, um, he talks about senses of place and our connection to the natural world and how objects are important to that. Uh, describing such feelings could serve as a useful purpose, I believe, in making us more self-aware and more conscious of why we respond as we do to technology, or the impact of technology on the environment. Um, and I think it's one of the things that, you know, myself, it was something I had to learn to think about. A lot of my students find it really revelatory to understand why do they respond to certain colors, to the feel, to the shape of certain objects here um, in everyday life. Um, and just another quote I want to read, you know, technology is not an abstraction, it's a material reality that demands the full use of the vital immediacy of sight touch and the other senses. Um, so he has different chapters, and I'm just going to give you a couple different examples that I always find very striking from them to give you an idea of what, because that itself can become abstract. What does it mean for technology to have? Let me start with the first one. Um, sound, the audio dimension of technology. What, what is that about? How is that important? Um, he starts with a lot of interesting studies and a lot of interesting observations by anthropologists about the importance of bodily rhythms and muscular rhythms to the way people work, and the way that we choose tools that fit into that rhythm. So items that have slow beats, like clocks, or a certain sides, like the length of a side, side determines how far you can swing it. And that's tied to kind of muscle rhythms, and humans have certain beats that we're kind of almost programmed to enjoy more than others. Whereas the faster the machinery gets, the more it makes you excited. And that could be a good thing, that's why the military has always had high beats for marches, like if you were to get people to get excited into battle, you would beat faster or literally increase the heart rate, make people excited. Um, not so good sometimes for workers and machines and factories. In fact, one of the things that people studied was that machine work required a whole new learning of rhythms. And the sound of the machine um, was really important to whether workers could concentrate and do their work with a kind of rhythmic musical quality, the kind of patterns or whether they got distracted or even kind of neurotic, just the pace was too fast, the sound was too high. And in fact, when electronics came, one of the really hard things is electronics beats at a frequency often that's a high-pitched whine. You don't even hear a beat, you just hear a whining sound. And that's really annoying to people. I mentioned the refrigerators and the hum of the early electric compressors. So there's all these ways in which the audio experience of a technology shapes how we use it, whether we find it comfortable or not, um, he talks about how uh, car manufacturers actually manufacture different engine sounds for different consumer groups. So like Harley Davidson and other motorcycles want a low purr. We can hear that kind of rhythm. Whereas young people want these like high-pitched, I feel like with the microphone, I shouldn't imitate this, but the, if you've seen, or like the Japanese market, these motorcycles are like, you know, like super high pitch. But companies, when they sell a car in Japan versus Kenya, versus the US will actually engineer different sound qualities because people like that. Um, and again, he goes into examples of like sewing machines and just all the ways in which our sense of pleasure and purpose, but also how we fit it into our daily kinetic routines are shaped by the sound it makes. And he does similar things with kind of visual cues. Um, now some of this can be things like very aesthetic judgments, certain colors trigger in us ideas about um, the pleasure of the object, but also who it belongs to. So one of the things that's very interesting in the US is how technologies for the home, consumer goods, like refrigerators, other appliances, became quickly done in kind of enameled white. Um, in fact, they were called, economists I think still call them white goods, like, you know, because, and those were done with new ideas about germ theory and about letting dirt be seen, like the high visibility of white, let you see dirt very quickly so you can clean it. Um, and that got tied into notions, obviously, of cleanliness and the selling of soap and the domestic duties of wives to clean their homes. Um, meanwhile, when electronics came out in the 40s and 50s, they weren't sure what, to, what color to make them or how to symbolically make them look. And so a lot of the manufacturers said, well, let's make them look like military goods. Hard black plastics, 
certain interfaces, and, and psychologists have even done studies about if you change dishwashers to make them look like your VCR, like hard black with different controls, would men be more likely to use them, <laughs> and vice versa. But it hints to this point about the symbolism of material, the visual cues, people kind of, it becomes encoded in objects, who the object is for, is it an object of pleasure, like an object that has beautiful patterns, beautiful colors, or is it a very durable object that seems like it's Totally unesthetic. Uh, yes? Yes? Oh, you're going to wait for that. John Moore. The first thing you said uh, caused me to think of the cotton gin. And it replaced workers in the field, uh, and the sensory perception was lost. <coughs> this contradicts your opening remark, doesn't it? And, and the same thing with the steamboat, uh, replaced uh, rollers. Okay, so, so first of all, I contradict myself often, so <laughs> as I explore these things. Um, and, and I do, and I should say that like a lot of what I'm presenting to you are different views um, that's sometimes too contradictory, but I, I'm not going to take that easy road out. But, so no, the, the question about, um, if I understand you right, like, aren't there a lot of technologies that desensitize the world, that go from a world where you do things from hand to become automated, or like, you know, so that um, in a world in which you pick cotton by hand, you knew which bowls were the right humidity, or all that kind of tactile, tacit knowledge, and then all of a sudden it's done by machine, that really all you're doing is turning a handle or something. There's no sensory quality to that. That is definitely one aspect, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit too, because one of the things that this whole set of issues raises is, should we design technologies with the sensory aspect in mind? That it's important to engage the user so that they actually enjoy the experience and that they actually use some skill in it, as opposed to completely de-skilling and desensitizing. So one of the things that we'll talk about are people that said, we need a design philosophy and technology that actually addresses this issue. We want to make labor easier for people, but we don't want to completely de-skill it or create it in a world in which you don't connect to the outside. So, so anyway, yeah, um, I think Pacey was interested that even in the mechanical world, even in that world that we would think would have no sensory aspects, there still were all of these things he discovered about work rhythms, people would sing to the music of instruments in shops. They would like have kind of different ditties and things that they would sing along um, in order to keep rhythm, in order to kind of keep mental focus. Like imagine doing for eight hours a particular kind of lathe activity, like in a shop. That's really hard, and if you mistake, you can not only mess up the item, but hurt yourself very badly. And so the way people tried to figure out how to kind of keep focus often involved using the machine's rhythm to again, kind of sing songs or do things like that. So, but I don't think he would dispute the point that you're also making, which is that is still a lesser level of sensory experience than maybe someone using a hand tool or something like that. So thanks for yeah, bringing that up. And uh, like I said, I'll, I'll get, I think we'll explore these issues as we move along as well. Um, you know, the, the other thing, one other thing I'd say about this is that this topic actually brings in a lot of issues in the field of design. So this is the part in the class where I'll often have people reading uh, books by people that think about design. I don't know if anyone's ever encountered Donald Norman. He wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things, or the original copy was called The Psychology of Everyday Things. Norman became kind of, oh, is anybody to stop here? Monty, you have a question? Yes, Monty Redinus. I heard this morning on the radio that Harley Davidson's going to start making electric motorcycles. Okay. But the question the announcer had was, how are you going to make it roar? <laughs> well, there was a lot of talk, I mean, this guy, yeah, these issues, there's a lot of talk with electric cars, like car enthusiasts that enjoy the feeling of driving. And this goes into things like manual transmission versus stick transmission. What's the value of having someone connected to the actual process of driving and using skill to shift, and why do people value that, right? But when they were, Americans and other Europeans were designing electric cars, they're like, do, should we create an artificial engine noise? Like, that you could turn on and maybe you could set it to different volumes, and maybe you could set it to 
you know, the Harley Roar or like my Studebaker, you know, Purr or whatever, like different <laughs> settings. I know in Japan there are cars that have settings like that that allow you to change the engine noise um, for people. And then maybe in other countries, this is in my area of specialty, but I just know the example of Japan. But I, do, I think that's a, an important, I guess it's the symbolic question. Right? People don't ride Harleys just because they want to get from point A to B. Right? Like many technologies, it's a choice about lifestyle, about pleasure, about what you enjoy. The same with bicycles. Right? People ride bicycles, they're making a statement about who they are, what they enjoy um, in terms of movement and things like that. So I hadn't heard about Harley making electric. That's going to be a fraught move for them. Uh, but it'll be an interesting one to see. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I was just trying to say, like, the, the design philosophy, one of the things Norman was, was famous for in the 80s and 90s was talking about, like, if you encounter a lot of awkward experiences with the technological world, it's often not your fault. It's the fact that the object is sending you the wrong visual cues. So if you go up to a door and there's a door plate, you expect it to push, right? And in fact, doors that were designed increasingly in the 70s and 80s for aesthetic reasons that had no plates or handles, People didn't know what to do with the door, right? In fact, they would hide the hinges so you wouldn't see the hinge, and so you don't even have a visual cue of which way. So, um, And he has all these examples about why people can never figure out which burner on a stove corresponds to which turn dial, right? How do you, you know, he's basically like, we live in a world where people can't program the VCR, they don't know how to adjust the refrigerator, and he's like, these aren't your faults. These are design choices made because people didn't take into importance, the centrality of visual cues, the way that you should look at an object, and he used this word from psychology called affordance. An object affords you, allows you to do certain things, and it, it's important that it sends the visual cues to tell you how to do them. Um, so again, it's, it's, and here we get into not only design, but a lot of psychology. So a lot of how we interact is really based on this material, physical nature of the object. It can be, like I said, color, it can be the design, the way handles are designed. Some of that's culturally specific, so if you've ever traveled to a different part of the world, sometimes you don't know those visual cues, you don't understand the different signs by which you operate all the material things. Um, another interesting example is for those, do we have any left-handers um, in the room? We should, yes, exactly. You navigate a world where it clearly wasn't designed with you in mind sometimes, right? So you will find that it was a world designed for people with right hands. And the same thing for people that are extremely short, extremely tall, or have any physical characteristics that make them slightly different than the vast majority of people who design and engineer the fit world. So anyway, when we look at this sensory, material, physical aspect, we get a lot into that. Um, and the same with touch and the tactile dimensions. Um, here, Pacey does a lot with like woodworking, people who do clothing and sewing, all these different fields where it's just so important to touch the item and to, um, to feel it. Um, and it's true also, people often, when I ask my students, like, what's your favorite object, they'll talk about something and it fits in their hand perfectly. Or people have this experience with a tool that they love. It just, it just kind of fits with them. You can imagine Neruda kind of just getting very excited about the feel, the touch of the hand. Um, and all of this he kind of talks about is this realm of tacit knowledge. This is not the world of engineering and science and kind of book learning. This is the world of our everyday interactions with technology, and he tries to kind of trace them through different periods of time, even though I do think that the arc is largely one of senses becoming less important than they were in earlier periods, but still kind of existing. Um, and I don't know if anyone has read in here, this is a piece I assign off to the student, Robert Piercig's kind of classic 1974 book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, I always loved the, the fact that Persig had 124 rejections for this book from publishers before he finally got one to print it, and it became a kind of instant classic. But it's you know half philosophical text, um, half kind of American story of life on the road and journey in the kind of vein of um, you know, on the road with Kerouac and things like that. But as someone who studies technology, it's an amazing text in terms of thinking about these sensory aspects because. Zen is traveling with his son on a trip from Minnesota to California, and he's always tuning his motorcycle and talking about how he's listening to the sound of it and how he can hear and feel that the oil mixture is too rich with the gas, and then he's like looking at the spark plugs, and he goes into all this detail, and I'm not a motorcycle person, but I find it just fascinating. It's a glimpse into the world of someone who loves something 
and loves it enough that he's taking care of it, he's constantly working on it. Like I said, I imagine all of you probably have something like that in your life. Uh, it might, you might not even think about it as technology. Like my example personally would be knives, like as far as cooking. I do, a, I know people are gonna scare when I say knives, but I do a lot of cooking. And for me, like maintaining a sharp blade um, and learning how to hone that blade and understanding the process, like I feel at one with my cooking knives. And you'll notice chefs like don't use other people's knives, you don't let them touch theirs. It's something that I really care about. And like I said, I imagine all of you have something in your life, probably mul multiple things in which you de derive pleasure. And Pierce gives us a way to think about it even philosophically. And part of the Zen is about, um, and the kind of Buddhist roots is about being in the world and not rejecting the material world, not rejecting technology, which was very popular in the early 1970s, but instead thinking how you can enjoy it in its sensory dimensions and how you can learn from it and how you can have kind of self-awareness and self-growth. So it's an amazing text for that you know, reason. Um, and then I wanted to do an example that, from the class uh, in a similar vein, going way back to stone tools. I bring in John Whitaker from the anthropology department who always does flint napping demonstrations and activities with my students. So this is like one of the first units we often do in the class as we're starting to read about the sensory world and trying to get them to think of technology as not just airplanes and missiles <coughs> and rockets, but that it's, the, you know, it's, a, it's a huge field of the human endeavor. There's nothing better than to give students stone and to kind of explain flint mapping and, and to learn this process of visual and tactile, like you have to look at the rock and carefully notice where it might break and how to hit it and you start to feel it and when you do it the first time you're terrible at it like anything in life and you start to learn, you start to kind of almost see where the fissures are and where they could break. Um, and, and I also think this is a world that is going to fast disappear in the academy. John even gets students to light fire in classes, and I keep seeing all these risk management plans. <laughs> this, this is going to be shut down soon. <clears throat> this is a world that will not last. But while it does, I mean, it really makes students and myself think about stone tools differently. It's very hard to read a piece sometimes on stone tools, and you see a hundred of them in a display, and they look all the same to you. You have no connection to them. And so a skilled writer can sometimes make stone tools come to life, but it's nothing like working with them. Um, in person here. And then I wanted to bring in this example, because this is the hardest sense you can imagine sometimes with technology, smell. Um, and, and to bring us into like even the modern world. So this, there was an article that just came out this spring in the journal Technology and Culture called Smelling Machine History, or Factory Experiences of Information Technology. It's based on a 30-year study um, in Finland where they were asking people about their experiences of getting technology, working in offices, playing video games. They just had done this long longitudinal study. And one of the things that they noticed is smell kept popping up all the time um, as people would talk. And again, this is the world that would seem the most divorced from the senses when you get into computers, right? What, what possibly, how could they smell? So I'm going to give a couple of the quotes that I found most interesting, right? The basic smell of new electronics when you open a package. I will forever remember what my first Commodore 64 computer oh smelled like <laughs> when the package was open. Nothing matches that. Well, maybe fresh sweet rolls. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking immediately of the new car smell is kind of the thing that we always talk about most, right? But this was a lot with electronics. Uh, people talked about the smell of new plastic when you buy a new machine or component. It's reminiscent of technology, evolution, progress. And as I remember, yes, you can kind of smell that. Flat, like when you open something here, right? it's this very distinctive. And like all the senses, um, the sensory experience brings up memories. Um, it connects you almost immediately to memories of the past. There was a lot of talk about remembering smelling dot matrix printers, if you remember the ones that like, yes. or in ink smells. Um, there was a lot about the smell of burning dust or other things that people knew there were problems with their computers often by the smell, or they even talked about how old computers would start to smell like they were dying because of this burnt smell. So anyway, just a reminder, and it's, it's an unusual place to look for it, but a reminder that the sense of smell was really important to the way ordinary users experienced computers. But also there's a lot in here about office work and what it was like to work in the mainframe computer rooms that were specifically very dry. No one had been in an environment with that kind of filtered air. Um, and the smell of originally vacuum tubes and other things, but they used smell to both diagnose what was going on, but also it just, they knew that they were in a particular type of environment. In a particular... Give me a graph. 
Oh, the mini event. Okay, right, exactly. Right. Okay, do you remember? Yes, exactly. So for every technology, like, and I imagine this is true with, you know, people that work with, like, wood, I mean, wood makers talk a lot about they can smell as they're, you know, grinding and stuff like that. But the mimeograph, on campus, the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies seminar, um, Leah Allen has them recreate, like, the experience of typing letters. Um, kind of like a steno pool. She gets together about 15 typewriters, and you can hear Mears Cottage that, and, but one of the things that's very interesting is students say, and, it's, and I've heard this in other places, that they wrote more aggressive letters than they expected because the experience of kind of typing and banging tended to make them kind of let loose because they're supposed to be writing letters to editors. Um, and there was no ability to go back and redo the wording and stuff like that. So they kind of had this moment that I would you know, I'd love my technology students to have, which is to do the experience to write something is very different on a typewriter to do it you know, with a mimeograph or something else, that it is on a word processor, that, that sensory experience can actually affect how you think and how you articulate your thoughts and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so this is a field of research that's a little bit on the edge of technology stuff. I mean, this isn't the kind of thing you'll see in most technology textbooks, but it's an emerging field. I think it's a really important one about the senses and how we interact. Um, and I wanted to bring up another example that I find also kind of fascinating, um, the transition from one material to another in physicality. And so I want to just say a quick word about research done by Eric Schatzberg about the switch from wooden airplanes to metal airplanes. Because the story you would expect is that metal is superior to wood, so that's why it replaced wood. But that's not at all clear from what he found when he studied this in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Instead, what he found was that engineers thought metal was the symbolic material of the future, and that to build aircraft out of wood was to kind of harken back to a world of craftsmen and woodworkers, and it was 19th century. It was kind of embarrassing to have planes made out of wood. You wanted the, the material of the future. You see this a lot with plastics or other things. Um, and so they, you know, metal was more expensive, it weighed more than wood. One of its main um, Benefits was supposed to be that it prevented fire, uh, but actually he kind of shows that like when the post office bought a fleet, their first fleet of 20 aluminum planes from Germany in the 1920s, I think something like 14 of the 20 were lost to fire accidents. There's a really thin sheet of aluminum, there's no fire, in fact it melts and kind of like creates fire in other areas. So he just kind of, as an outsider, he kept watching people say, metal is superior, metal is the future, and watching them struggle really hard to do that. Here's an example, just so you can see of a plane, so you can see clearly its original kind of wood frame. These are the kinds of planes being built in the past. But again, it gets to the point I was trying to make with white goods and other things, which is we invest symbolic meaning into um, the actual materials. It's not just a utilitarian question. Is wood better than metal or something? It's a symbolic question about, it's an aesthetic question about what we think this material symbolizes. And you see it even today. I mean, it's, you go into like vintage stores, or you see an object that is designated as craft or vintage, it's not going to be made out of titanium or metal, right? It's going to be made out of wood, even if they can make it easier or better with another material. Because they're trying to signal to you, a cue, that this is you know, something that represents tradition, right? And again, if it's something modern, something high-tech, even if they could use wood or other materials, they're going to use something that signals the future. And you can see this with electronics, the way they kind of but again, we get the sense of the, the visual and the aesthetic cues are really important to how we understand the object and ourselves. Um, and so I want to then transition to a kind of broader, so that's like one perspective we explore in the class. I want to transition to a broader set of questions about, um, that I was starting to allude to, which is how should we design technology? Um, if this is important, to the way we interact with technology, the sensory side, the sense of um, you know, personal worth, creativity, how we use an object. Um, and I wanted to bring up this kind of debate. It's often called appropriate technology. There was a movement in the 1970s, and it still exists today, but to think about consciously designing technology um, at a human scale and with people in mind. Um, and what would that look like here? And this is a very long point I'm going to read. All of this. But I was going to talk about E.F. Schumacher for a second. Um, he wrote this book that came out just a year or so uh, before P. 
Piercing's book. It's called Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. Um, it also had a subtitle in later editions, like A Buddhist View of Economics. There was a lot of interesting intersection between Buddhism and people thinking about technology in the 1970s that is worth remembering. But a lot of things I just want to highlight. So this book, um, you know, he talks about, um, let me see about how to kind of condense this really long quote down. Um, it says like, you know, the key concept of Buddhism is about wisdom and that as an economist. And I should say that Schumacher himself was a PhD economist who ran the coal industry in Britain. So he's not like living on a commune as some kind of philosopher beatnik. He's like, you know, one of, one of Britain's most serious economists had run a giant sector of the economy. Um, then he went and traveled around the world and had kind of an awakening experience and kind of felt that the entire approach towards science and technology um, in the post-war period of bigger, better, faster, more expensive, complex technology um, had fundamentally misunderstood the human character. Uh, but anyway, so he talks about how like wisdom is what we should be looking for as a society. Like the key to wisdom is permanence, not ever-ending expansion um, and greater things. And anyway, he, he called for the book, and this was a really influential book, he called for we call, uh, a new kind of we said, appropriate technology or intermediate technology. So we're not going to stick with all the tools that we had in the past. He wasn't saying like you should, um, and I know the Amish aren't like this, but an example like the Amish of like kind of set yourself in the technological world 200 years ago and anything that is new you would reject. So he was rejecting that, but he was also rejecting this idea that all new science and technology were good as well. And instead he's like we should have a checklist of values. Um, and so his checklist and three that he lists here, most importantly, every technology should be cheap enough so that it's accessible to virtually everyone. Um, new technology or good technology should be small scale in application. Here's that title, Small is Beautiful. So um, even if you create a, a great technology that will, um, an example that he was thinking in mind is like a tractor. Right? People were sending tractors to Africa in the 1970s. Um, and they were like, this is gonna help you out. It's gonna you know, produce all this harvest. And then they discovered that people didn't have the money to pay for the gasoline for it. People didn't have anyone to repair a John Deere or a Harvester tractor or the parts for it. And so there were all these pictures in the mid-70s of tractors just sitting in fields. It became its own genre of kind of just to show um, how technologies from the West seemed to miss the mark. Um, instead, they were like, what about investing in better animal traction technology? So don't send an international harvester. Um, send a new kind of plow that attaches to the animals that people have there. A better plow, a really well-designed plow that anyone can repair, anyone can afford. Um, and this last point is compatible with man's need for creativity. Um, and on this, he would cite Gandhi, he would cite, um, I can't remember, Pope Pius XI, who wrote a cyclical on human labor. There were a lot of people in the 1960s and 70s that were saying the problem with mass production and mass technology is that it's de-skilled work. And it's taken the creativity and the word and the meaning out of it. And that humans can have dignity and can have a sense of self and love unless they're doing work that engages them in the sensory way and engages them in terms of creativity. Um, and so, one of the, yeah, so, uh, and he drew a lot on Gandhi uh, in the book. And I often assign parts of this in the class because it's a really interesting text for my students to grapple with, to think about how much should values guide technology. And, um, you know, what would it look like to design a whole new type of technology based on different values? So Schumacher, like, he was a very cheeky person, but in, I love this, the first law of economics, the amount of real leisure society enjoys tends to be in inverse proportion to the amount of labor-saving machinery employees. <laughs> so one of the things he encountered in the 70s was like, well, people need labor-saving machinery. Like, they work so hard in the developing world, and you all live in the first world, you know, you don't do anything, uh, you have all this labor-saving Machinery. And then he would look at the statistics and show that people, you know, in England, people in the United States work more hours than they used to. They work harder. And in fact, right around this time period, uh, Ruth Cohen wrote a book, More Work for Mother, which looked at all the economic data about the amount of housework that women did. And the expected story was with the rise of vacuum cleaning, all of these labor-saving technologies that women, washing machines, that they would have spent far less hours doing housework. Right? They would have more time to read to their children and things like that. But the studies clearly show the exact opposite, actually. Their amount had increased over time. Uh, because families and men had reduced their con contribution. So a classic example would be how do you clean a carpet? It used to be that you would clean a carpet once a year. 
and the family would go out as a group and beat the carpet, right? It was a family activity. Everyone helped, and it was done infrequently. Now, as a vacuum cleaner, it's true, it's easy to do, but you're expected to do it once a week by yourself. Uh, so, we're coming, yeah, we're, we're coming up on the kind of moment of time. So, anyway, there was just this idea, again, that, yeah, um, that there had been this really ironic consequence that all, all this attempt for labor saving uh, machinery had actually produced a society that, in his word, was kind of soulless, had a crisis of meaning, um, had too much work, not too little, didn't seem to enjoy life or have a sense of happiness. And he put the, the, the issue right at the crux of it, which is the technology redesign. And so he helped create, and again, this is a really long kind of quote, but he helped create, and others created these different institutes to promote new technology. And on the American side, where this became most popular, I don't know if anyone remembers the whole Earth catalog, and, and this is where you would see like communes, back to the land movement, or just people who enjoyed technologies that were meant to empower them. Um, and this is one of the things that for my students is most surprising, because they assume that any environmentalist would hate technology, especially in the 60s and 70s, and they're surprised to find out that there was a whole world of people who they hated Western, advanced industrial technology, but they loved tools and new technologies on a small scale. Small scale like generators that would get you off the grid, a Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome that allowed you to grow your own food. Um, the whole Earth catalog used to have a truck, tool truck that would go around selling all these different tools to people. But, so anyway, so there's this whole kind of world of um, interest in small scale. Again, the term that they would always use is appropriate technology. Appropriate for the scale and the dignity of human beings, as far as they should increase skill, not decrease skill. Allow you to do things even better, or things you haven't been able to do, rather than to replace you with a machine. So, um, and let me pause here and see, are there any questions? We're gonna have a break in just a second. If you mind holding one second, the microphone's gonna come right to you. The thing that you brought me to think about was, it's so much nicer to have computers. They are faster and we don't have to have all this paper. And then half the place, you have to print out exactly what they don't want, that they want to save. So there's no savings. <laughs> no savings in the paper of computer? Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I think she's going to hand you the microphone right behind you. Yeah. It's more comment, but all this rings very true to me because I lived in Copenhagen in the 60s. And at that time, there were a lot of small baker shops. In fact, there was one in every, in every block mm -hmm. up in the residential areas, which was most of the city. And they would, get, they would go to work at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they would make all the things they needed for the day, and they'd be sold out by 10 and 8 or 10 in the morning. You get up in the morning and go it, it was a still day, it smelled wonderful. <laughs> you, saw the I, you know, I love to get up in the morning in, in Copenhagen because it, it smells so wonderful. So the small is beautiful. And, and today, I, you know, I, Walmart makes their own bread. Oh, do they? Okay. And if you're and if you're out there, you know, they they the smell permeates the store, and it makes the place a more pleasant place to okay. visit because of that. Yeah. the smell is very important. You know, we commodified everything and and, and, and desensitized it, and, and you know, farms used to be, uh, you know, we, we have maybe a fourth of the families on the farm that we used to have. Right. These are all steps in the wrong direction, and it's partly because we're. Because our capital economic system is big is better. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those comments. Just a brief comment on George Drake. Uh, don't you think also with all the so-called labor-saving devices in homes, that homes then sort of inevitably grew bigger, larger? <laughs> Yes, no, they do. And, you know, these things cost money to buy often, and so there's a kind of cycle. Like, an example with washing machines that they found is that in order to get the washing machine, you would have to have piped in water, usually, and electricity, and those are monthly bills. So they found people actually engaging in more work outside the home to pay for those amenities. Yes, and the home gets bigger, and that's more work to, to keep up on. And my goal is not necessarily to tell students that they should, you know, become the world of Schumacher, but to present them an articulate... Um, case, a full-throated case for how you could use values to rethink technology, to rethink the way communities work. And uh, you mentioned the paper office. Like I, I also assigned a piece by Edward Tinner, who calls, he wrote a book called Why Things Strike Back, and it's about the revenge effects. And one of his big examples is 
The story of progress is often so much more complex. And so he mentions the office that was supposed to be paperless. It was supposed to get rid of relying on women and secretaries and things like that. And it actually created less efficiency, created more need for women. So this is a story that like, when you look at the tale of progress and things like that, it's often so much more complex and even perverse or ironic in the sense of unintended. Computer, you have to wait and wait and wait for something to come up. Right, exactly right, yeah. So, um, Mine comes up right away. <laughs> and we have one, one more we'll take in before. If, and I should say there's a really interesting piece written by the agronomist Wendell Berry in 1982 called Why I Will Not Buy a Computer. In which he was using Schumacher's point to say, like, I don't know how to fix a computer. It makes me dependent on electrical companies, which I don't think are great. Like, it's going to replace my working relationship with my wife. We dictate, we work together. He kind of goes through a checklist of the reasons why he's going to make an informed choice. It's very hard for my students to engage with that, because to them, to not accept a computer is to be, you know, um, uh, a Luddite, right? Like, to not accept. So these things are complicated, but yeah. But I think the small is better, and uh, looking at the problems of uh, <coughs> Changing technologies, whether uh, right now I'm thinking of a farm experience. Mm -hmm. When we lived in Northwest Iowa, there was a group of um, young men and women who wanted to change organic farming, wanted to uh, get rid of big equipment, and uh, they started a little commune. Well, their their efforts to turn the clock back made their neighbors very angry. Oh, uh, so um, sometimes you can't turn the clock back. Uh, sure, or an economy when you're competing. No, I, 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 yeah. This was up in the Los Hills, and houses were <coughs> kind of far apart, but still, the group found a house that wasn't being used, and they turned it into a barn, and they, they built a retaining wall with old tools that was going to cave in, right. and the goats were running free, and the neighbors just did not like turning back of technology. Oh yeah, the, no, the, the aesthetic and the orderly sense of people that, you know, without the rows and letting weeds grow and stuff like that. I tell you what, why don't we, that's a great comment, we'll, I'll respond a little bit when we come back. Um, and I do think that in Iowa, when we think about farming, and you know, yeah, let me, I'll pick that up and run with that afterwards, thank you. Let's plan on it. 10 minute break, if you'll look at the clock, and uh, be responsive. I was starting to suggest you know, the appropriate technology movement and this conversation that really flourished kind of around the world in the early 1970s, late 1960s, to me is a better point at which to talk to my students about how we accept technology, how do we criticize it, how do we think about different technology, rather than, I use the term Luddite, and some of you may have heard of the Luddites that were um, skilled craftsmen in England who broke some of the new mechanized spinning and other machines because it was threatening to destroy their craft work. That's a longer, I feel like as a historian I should say this, that's too long ago, but I feel like that is a harder entree into the subject for my students, and even for myself to think about, than these more recent debates, um, which is not about, again, rejecting technology, but rather demanding, in some ways, even more from technology. That it be not only good, but cheap, accessible, easy to fix, that it, it fits in with our aspirations in terms of democracy and kind of more shared wealth in the economy or whatever. So like, um, so, you know, I take us back to the 1960s, I have students read Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, I have them look through the whole earth catalog, um, and, and I should say too that a lot of the Stuart brand, and there's a lot of work now that computing in the 1960s, especially the idea of a personal computer, as opposed to mainframe, came out of this kind of countercultural world of San Francisco with people like Stuart Brand and others. Um, but even today, I, I'm currently, when I look around the world, and this is why I want to come back to this issue of farming, because I am very conscious of the fact that, like, you know, when I say these views, is Schumacher saying that like a farmer that uses a large, you know, harvester is destroying the world and is engaged in that kind of soulless pursuit. I mean, it's easy for myself or someone else to say that who doesn't work on a farm. Like, what would, how would we really navigate the, this difficult world of making choices? Um, and so the example I like to use in the present day, and I'm trying to get students or other academics to work on this, is actually the modern food industry. 
but not in the United States, but over in Europe. So I want to just take a, a few minutes to talk about a whole framework that has developed in Europe since the 1920s for geographically protected food items. So in, Fran in France, it goes by AOC. <coughs> in Italy, DOC. If you ever buy wines or cheeses, you'll often see these designations. The EU and the current WTO have this category of PGI, which is just kind of broad umbrella. This basically is, creates a legal framework for traditional producers of food items that are distinctive to control and own the right to call, for instance, prosciutto di Parma, right? uh, this kind of famous type of ham prosciutto, or Parmesan Reggiano, which I'll talk about in a second. Right? You cannot sell cheese like Parmesan around the world and call it Parmesan. Parmesan is kind of a protected category. They own the right to the title, but what's more interesting is they get the right to decide how it will be produced. And I think they're one of the most interesting groups, more than, like I said, the Amish or the Luddites. I think today's world of these producers, they make choices every day about whether to embrace new technologies or to use centuries-old traditions. And they make those decisions based on their own purposes and goals and a kind of participatory <coughs> way. Um, and they're large industries, I should say, like by comparison. I want to talk about the wine industry, for instance. One of the things that's fascinating is that Wine, you know, is a protected kind of uh, commodity under these systems. You can't sell wine as Bordeaux unless you're in Bordeaux and part of this consortium that has the legal right to enforce its rules on its members, right? And these are big industries. Like I was looking at some statistics, the U.S. coal industry, which is the third largest energy producer. It's a big industry. We hear a lot about it in politics today. Coal employs 52,000 people and has a combined um, net sales revenue of, I think, $46 billion, right? By contrast, California sells $26 billion of wine. Just the state of California employs 300,000 people in its wine industry. Globally, these, are, so my point is, is, these are not boutique little groups that are like, you know, kind of selling crafts at the neighborhood fair. Oh, I love people like that. These are huge billion dollar industries. And yet they make decisions completely opposite to the way of normal industrial food decisions are made. So in the wine industry, they decide if you want your wine to have the flavor and the quality characteristics of being what's called oaked, uh, you have to put it in a handmade oak barrel. And these barrels are very expensive, but they made this decision because they said, you know what? This is a skill and a craft that's been around for 600 years. We want to sustain this. We want generations, the next generation, to learn to do it. Now, they don't insist that they use tools from 400 years ago. They say to the oak barrel makers, what tools do you want to use today, like modern tools? What old tools are really important for preserving skill that you don't think should be replaced? And so when you go into these kind of food worlds, you see the latest technology next to wooden paddles from the 8th century, like in terms of each is chosen for a particular region. They might, for instance, use wood paddles because wood collects certain kind of good bacteria that flavors cheeses, and they say like, no, we're not gonna replace it with copper or a mechanized machine. We're gonna pay someone to stir, someone who has the skill and knowledge over 20 or 30 years to know what is the right temperature, what does that cheese way look like in stirring. So anyway, the oak barrels, I think, is really fascinating. So they support this, they get it, you see them being fired. Um, industrial food producers would find this insane. They would be like, why don't you put either a chemical additive that tastes like oak, or, like um, a lot of beer today that's sold that's oaked, they actually take little chips. It would be so much cheaper just to cut little chips of oak and put it in the thing, right? I mean, it makes no economic sense, as, right? But again, thinking like Schumacher and others, if our goal is to create a community of skill and of value, um, and it actually can charge more money because these are highly sought after commodities, right? Um, you can make choices about the technologies you so Parmesan is another kind of classic example. This is a cheese that um, I'm sure many of you have had Parmesan or you know, kind of know the flavors, and, but it's, it's made in a 16th month process. I love this image. Every wheel is inspected. In fact, most of these regimes require human inspection. So they're not, you know, your wine to be classified as a Bordeaux. You know, they don't run through a spectrometer and kind of check that it has the right kind of thing. There's actually a person who tastes it every batch and says, like, does this meet the qualities by which it's a good job to have? <laughs> Here we have a cheese person using a hammer 
to do this. The, the only example I know of in the U.S. is Tabasco. I mean, there's probably more, but Tabasco is always kind of famous that they taste every barrel, that they don't mechanize the picking. They have people that have a, a color chart and pick the peppers at this exact moment. But over in Europe, like I said, there are billion-dollar industries in which it's all based on human skill. Um, these consortiums are usually made up of all the different levels of producers. So to take an example again with like cheese making, here we see someone, um, a kind of a good mix of, you know, this looks like a pretty state-of-the-art factory here in Parma. Um, but they still insist on using the kind of traditional hand-gathered cheese ways. They insist on putting on these wooden poles in kind of traditional fabric sacks made by local people. And they have all these interesting rules. The cows have to be of a certain breed. They have to be within, I, I think it's 15 kilometers of the little dairy. They could have centralized the dairy. They could have every cow coming to one. But they want to encourage local diversity of flavorings in terms of the type of feed. And so they want each cow to like have, each set of cheeses to have different flavors from their local regions and to be skillfully mixed. And so you'll see this a lot with these kinds of systems. They have um, rules and they work with the, the um, dairy farmers and the herds people and others to decide like, what are the rules by which we can make a delicious product and again, it's supporting the incomes and the, you know, the skill that we want throughout the community. I think they're also interesting because they're not necessarily closed systems. Like you'd say, like, well, that's fine for a community of 300 people. It's always done this for 600 years. But they're actually kind of open. Like the Parmesan industry right now, I forget the percentage, but a huge part of their workforce are, um, are from Punjab. There's Sikhs that moved there in the 1970s. And the Punjab is a particular region in, in India that has very similar herding and dairy experience, and so they've kind of helped save and kind of in some ways they're now participating in these discussions. Um, so we're not talking about just preserving a frozen medieval past. These are industries, again, that choose new technologies, incorporate new people, but they do it all in a framework that allows them to make collective decisions about the technologies they want. Here's some other examples of kind of all, you know, human judgment and skill-based items. So, this is a, I don't know if you've heard of this kind of system. I'm always surprised at how little research has been done if I were of present day. I mean, Carla's coming to talk to you about automation, which I think, as someone who studies technology, is one of the most important things here in the West to deal with. If I wanted to ask someone to go study something else, I'd do automation, and then I would ask someone to go over to Europe to study this kind of system or some other part of the world. But I think we need scholars to kind of explore this more and help us understand um, the benefits and the downsides. And there are attempts to move this, um, the tea industry, like Darjeeling tea, I think, is applying for this status. Um, it hasn't worked out quite as well in tequila. Tequila tried to kind of create a kind of legal framework like this, but it hasn't seemed to really work in ways that I could talk about some other time. But, um, but I think, as I was going to say, like this system is to me allows for this multi-generational preservation of techniques and technologies. Um, these are really high levels of employment and wages and profits for local people. Um, and there's been areas that have, you know, you can see a real difference when they go from having just ordinary cheese to having a special protected cheese, because um, consumers are willing to pay more. Um, this point about having a say, I think, is really important. They have these like kind of like annual meetings where the cheese makers, the, the cheese agers, the dairy herdsmen, they all come together and they make these decisions about what are the rules by which they want to um, you know, navigate social, environmental, and technological change. And I also find it fascinating because none of this is coercive. This isn't the state, oh sorry, this isn't the state saying you have to do this. This is just them saying we're going to create a framework by which people who want to pursue this collectively can. So if I'm a wine grower in Bordeaux, I don't have to sell my wine as Bordeaux. I can just sell it in this French wine. I can do whatever I want cherry juice in it, I can throw oak chips. I just can't sell it as Bordeaux. So I, I think that's important to know. It doesn't, it doesn't make people do a certain thing. It just it creates a framework by which some people can prosper by making collective decisions. So like I said, I would love to be there listening to them make decisions about should we have an all-steel fermentation tank with a bricks digitized reader to decide as we you know, do champagne? Or should we have the Riddler, the person who, I love this job, person who walks around and turns all the wine bottles by a quarter, like the Riddler. They, they literally, once every two weeks, they go do a quarter turn to every bottle of champagne. 
And the question is, should that be mechanized? Couldn't you do it machine? Or is that a particular kind of skill? I don't know how you would not get trouble, 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 but is that a skill that you value and want? These are the questions that they answer all the day. And I don't know many places that answer these questions. In the US, these are usually decided by simple questions of efficiency and economics of cost. And they don't usually involve the person working in the industry. So, so anyway, so I want to move on to another topic. I'm going to move a little quickly. but. Um, it's a little related to that. It's one that we deal with a lot in the class, which are, are technologies inherently political? And by political, I don't mean just the narrow sense of, you know, the electoral system and votes. I mean political in the sense of, do they shape the contours of power um, and give authority or power to one group more than another, right? This is a deep question that people have thought a lot about. Um, in fact, even, uh, Going back to Plato, Plato has a famous kind of part of his dialogues where he opposes writing as a new technology uh, because it's going to shift power and authority away from speaking to people, it will shift power from the old to the young, and he has all these interesting, it's always surprising to think of Plato as being against writing, um, but he is, starts a dialogue that continues to this present day about the political impacts of technology. I wanted to um, bring in an example from the 19th century with um, Cormac. Cyrus McCormick um, and his very large McCormick works in Chicago. Um, and a lot of them I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll put in the bibliography if those are interested. There's a famous article written in 1981 by Langdon Winner, who's a political scientist and who's testified before Congress on a lot of these issues. And he wrote an article called Do Artifacts Have Politics? And he kind of walks through a lot of different examples. Um, a lot come to from the realm of architecture, like the way we design cities and create, do we create, for instance, mass transit, which allows people to move certain ways, or do we create, he focused a lot on Robert Moses, the famous road builder, um, who did not like public transportation, so he designed New York in a way that made his preferences kind of locked into the system, his politics, or he was infamous for putting overpasses at a low level that would not allow buses to get underneath them um, in order to prevent public transport to places like Jones Beach and Long Island. So it's a, it's a very arresting example, but it's an example about how something that looks neutral on its face, how could a bridge have politics? It's actually woven into decisions about who can move and how we create an infrastructure. So, and you could probably think about, you know, are buildings accessible? Are they accessible to all people? And, you could, architecture is a great place to look at this, right? Um, but there are other examples, and so one of the examples he brings up, one of many is how a lot of, on their face, labor-saving technologies were really employed and developed solely to de-skill workers and to break unions. And so McCormick was a good example of this. McCormick had an iron molders union that had good wages, very skilled people helped build all of those reapers and different items, but they wanted a share of the profits, and he wanted to not be holden to them. He didn't want, he really resented having to share power in the factory with them as far as decisions and stuff. And so he spent a lot of money to develop pneumatic molding engines that would mold pieces of iron without human people, if that makes sense. So he's like an, an early example of like automation. Um, and what's so interesting is, is that it's often, historians just remark, this is the kind of march of progress um, this is inevitable, these technologies emerge and replace people. But um, Winner and other historians that have looked at it show that these machines were terrible, they didn't work well at all. And in fact, as soon as McCormick, he spent a fortune to develop them, and as soon as he broke the iron molders union, he went back, he got rid of the machines, and went back to hand labor. Um, and you'll see this a lot in automation, like, and things like, they often don't work for their supposed goal of replacing people all the time. They're often used as a short-term expedient to break unions or to lower wages or things like that. Um, another famous example, Eli Whitney was um, kind of famous for making interchangeable parts, um, guns that could be you know, put together, different things. And historians that look at the guns notice that they're, they're not interchangeable at all. Like you can see all the file marks and we have all these records that they didn't actually, the machines ever worked at putting them together. Like they have to get skilled craftsmen to come shave them, refit them, things like that. For about 40 years, he worked with a system of interchangeable parts that actually didn't work in practice. But, um, but we see this a lot. But again, the goal is to create a kind of public face and to create a system in which you can um, wrest power away from the people uh, who work. And the people who, like uh, Schumacher and others we're talking about, have skill, 
have uh, meaning and worth. Um, so there's a lot of struggle, a lot of politics in factories, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot about this from Carla too when she talks about automation and trucking. There's things too that, now that's the example of a kind of nefarious, you could imagine McCormick almost as a mustachioed villain, ha ha ha, you know, we have letters from him saying like, I want to break the union, like these are terrible machines, like, but they're going to help me gain a political hand over my rivals. But what about machines that seem totally neutral on their face? So an example that I like um, is the, this was developed at UC Davis, this is the mechanical tomato harvester. Uh, it's on the list of historical landmarks by the American Society of Engineers. Developed by UC Davis, no conservative bastion of capitalism, mustachio evil villains. This was a work done by professors to, to create what they thought would save back-breaking labor in terms of tomato production. Right? Certainly, this is not a device that is political, that involves power. But Langdon Wynn and others talk about how you know, UC Davis is funded by the US Department of Agriculture. Um, this device, he would argue, is inherently political because it's going to shift the terrain of production. It's going to produce a world in which you have to buy this device or you won't be able to compete with other people. So let's leave workers out even for the moment. Small-scale producers, once this kind of machine emerges, are going to be put in a quandary. They can either raise money to buy this expensive machine, in which case they're probably going to also have to expand their acreage of production to compete. And in that game where you're always buying more technology, expanding your scale, going deeper into debt, more and more family farms are going to drop out, more and more small-scale producers. So part of what he was arguing is there's an inherent politics to this kind of machine. Like once it's created, no matter how you want to use it, it's going to lead to consolidation. It's going to lead to a greater hierarchy of power in the industry, um, let alone the workers themselves who will find themselves now becoming either, um, and here's what's interesting, they're not necessarily totally removed, they're still doing some sorting. You'll see the crews of women here. But maybe it's a job that can be, you can replace men with lesser paid women or children, right? To do the sorting rather than the backbreaking. So he would argue we have a lot of this kind of technology in the US that is funded and designed with no, no malicious intent, but it will have, according to him, inherent political qualities. It will change the dynamics of the economy and the distribution of power between different groups. And so that's something to grapple with. And you know, I talked to my students about it. It's something here in the US that we grappled with, especially again that moment in the 70s, which was really a kind of moment of debate and questioning. Congress created an Office of Technological Assessment, which existed from 1972 till uh, one of the planks um, in the Republican takeover of Congress, the Contract of America with Newt Gingrich, was to um, end the Office of Technological Assessment. So in their first week, that was one of the things they did. The OTA, the Office of Technological Assessment, was set up to handle these troublesome questions. The first one that they handled, some of you may remember supersonic travel. Would the US allow supersonic travel, like the Concorde and others? Would it develop that? Um, what would be the implications? There was a lot of controversy because it breaks windows. Um, they did also dealt with fluoridated water, putting fluorine, um, fluoride, sorry, in water and things like that. So they took on some controversial, and they took on subjects like automation, but their main goal was to be an independent agency of scientists and um, engineers and scholars of technology who would study the impact of technology. What would be its political impact, or its economic, or its social? What would happen if you create automated bakeries, right? Like as far as, you know, would it change the nature of communal business patterns or consolidate the industry? And they would produce these specialized reports with the idea that Congress could then pass legislation to potentially regulate or shape technology. They could only do that if they were informed. So this was, a, I think, a really interesting agency that, like I said, for 30 years studied this issue. And they experimented with some interesting ideas that every once in a while get traction, like having, um, the one I find probably most provocative is citizen juries. They were like, you know, you, we can provide technological assessment, but what if we impaneled citizen juries to make decisions about future technology. So right now we have like nanotechnology, right? Very small nanoscale technology. They're putting nano titanium particles as a whitener in food. Do we know what the effects are? We don't want to scare people and assume that all new technologies are bad. We also don't want to assume that all new technologies are good. Who gets to make that decision? Should it just be industry alone or should it be Congress and elective branches? Or should we, like I said, the one example is to impanel citizen juries that would have industry and other groups OTA present evidence and then the jury would decide 
what might be some of the steps that would be taken. Like, yes, you can use nanotechnology, but it has to be clearly labeled. Or you can use nanotechnology, but only in these forms. We have a lot of online, you know, upcoming technologies that um, many of us, to just to say consumers have a choice to either buy or don't, I think is not a satisfying answer. I think there should be some way to have thoughtful deliberation and democracy. Um, if we're going to have technologies that change all our lives, shouldn't we have some democratic way to weigh into it? And I should say that's a question. There's not necessarily an answer. People might say no. Like, having the government involved in technology is a terrible idea. It will stifle innovation, um, it will kill um, new ideas and whatnot. So it's something to think about and something to debate. Like I said, I feel as a society since the 70s, we haven't really grappled with that problem. And moving along, I, I want to talk also about different, you know, I'm hitting a lot of topics here, but one of the ones that is surprising in its importance, but its neglect, is the story of maintenance. Um, and I want to go back to the theme about global development, and we were talking about Schumacher and appropriate technology, and one of the things I was saying, like when they tried to transfer um, <coughs> tractors to the developing world, they discovered that it was inappropriate and that they weren't used, and so one of the examples that I look at a lot in class as kind of a case study is the hand pump. So originally they were like, well, everyone should move to cities, because that's what the Western industrial model is about. And we should build um, fluoridated, kind of advanced waterworks, right? The state should build a water distribution system. Um, that faced a lot of problems. Um, and so then they were like, you know, maybe it would be better if people just live in rural areas where they're at and continue. We're going to be sensitive, we're going to be appropriate, let's just build hand pumps to create water. Um, but we look at this example because it's so complex and so interesting. So it comes down to things like, where do you build the hand pump? Like, people often get water and it's a social activity. It's, I mean, even in the West, the water cooler, right, is the place where you're supposed to be. So imagine going to a village and people for generations have gone to a particular water site. And that's where they watch their children, that's where they exchange gossip, that's where ties are connected, kinship patterns, to replace it with some random pump somewhere else in the village. Um, totally rends the fabric of that community. So they have to think very carefully. They're hiring anthropologists to come study, figure out where to put the water in. But even the technical aspects, it's very hard to design hand pumps that don't break. So I have some statistics here. In the 1970s, um, when UNICEF reported that 70 to 80 percent of all hand pumps in India that were installed were out of order, um, the Peace Corps in 1977 did a study in Sierra Leone, after they had spent 10 years installing hand pumps that said only 40% were in order. In Thailand, there was the similar things. All around the world, they discovered quickly, within four or five years, all the pumps weren't working. Children would do things like children do. They would shove rocks down the pump. And so one of the things that you see in some of the newer designs is like a tube that bends downward so that you can't stick a rock or anything in there. Um, there were things about like, motion that's uncomfortable for some people or too hard for some people to work. But the main, so anyway, there's a lot of complexities, but the main thing was just this issue of maintenance. How do you design a device that does not break down? So all of these engineers that might be working, you know, one day on like supersonic flight end up being bedeviled the next day with how to design a hand pump. It's really hard to design a device that can be either maintenance-free or they came up with this term, the UNICEF of VLOM which is village level operating procedures, which is basically can it be fixed at a village level. So it needs to use parts and materials that can be fixed by local villages. Um, and it came to, you know, so this came up in the 60s and 70s, um, but I feel like just the last five or six years, historians and scholars of technology have become to realize that maintenance is this huge story that we've missed. And on the left here is the classic kind of book, which I put on the bibliography. It's a great book by Walter Isaacson about the innovators, how a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. But again, the focus is always on invention, innovation, never on maintenance, right? And so there was a, a group of scholars that um, joined together to form this organization called the Maintainers. That they actually have a website, and I love this, their title. The maintainers, how a group of bureaucrats, standards engineers, and introverts made technologies that kind of work most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing all this interesting work at conferences about how stuff gets maintained. And, and you know, in the US, obviously, one issue this comes up with is infrastructure, right? We poorly maintain our infrastructure. So we know that that's an issue. But in general, 
there's just so little scholarship that has been done on following actual people who maintain these things. And there's a quote from Doug Egerton. One of the things I like about it is, you know, he talks about maintenance and repair and matters that are pushed to the margins, often to marginal groups. And it's lived in this twilight world. In fact, it's kind of hard because a lot of countries don't even keep any statistics on maintenance. Although anyone that has been involved, like in the school district, will know the maintenance can often overshadow the cost of the building or of a unit of repair, things like that. So I feel like there's this vast continent of technological issues. And here's where a lot of our frustration as people come in with having to maintain items and deal with repairs. So this is a world that I think uh, we need to know a lot more about. If we started to study it, some of the things that we'll probably find is, I was just trying to say, that um, the cost um, and also the success of it, whether it succeeds or fails, has a lot to do, sometimes more to do with maintenance than the original design or the patent or the invention process. Um, we don't have great statistics. Canada and Britain um, actually did record statistics for a while, and they, in excluding buildings, so we're not talking about building maintenance, but just maintenance of mechanical and other equipment. And again, they're not going to include your personal maintenance of your but just as far as corporations and whatnot, the six to ten percent of GDP, mm. like a, a far larger amount than actually spent on like R and D or invention. Um, Britain actually kept statistics because they tried to rebrand this. This goes back maybe to the first class where I talked about like names matter, and they they started this new field of engineering called Tarot technology. Uh, tarot is from the Greek for like watchman, observer, like someone who maintains. So you'll find they have like a society of tarot technologists, but um, if you actually polled engineers, very few actually work on designing something or inventing. Almost all engineers work on maintaining stuff, mm -hmm. maintenance. And so that's a whole realm of engineering, again, that you, that you struggle to find books or articles about that aspect, and so you know, what kind of work that goes in. And there's a lot of interesting things about the geographic and cultural patterns that change over time. So in the West, we've become a society where most ordinary people do not repair things or maintain them become specialized, or you just throw away an item, right? Mm -hmm. Things are designed not to be repaired or maintained. Although that hasn't always been the case. Um, but that's increasingly the case, whereas if you look at other parts of the world, maintenance is a huge part. Like they often take the things that we get rid of and keep them in perpetual states of maintenance. They Maintaining things and, and fixing them can be a little bit like adding additions to your home. You change the quality of your home. It starts as one thing and ends as something else through the maintenance process. So there's actually a lot of creativity and innovation that helps, um, that comes out. And, um, and also, I was going to say this about the allure and frustration. So we have different stories that come up. On the alluring side, uh, we know of technologies where invent, um, developers realize that, having, that people like fixing them. So the classic example is radio sets in the 1920s and 30s. They start off as something they're like, we need to create this, we, don't want it. we want it to stay fixed. We want it to be like a black box, no one should open it up, because they'll just mess it up. And then they realize that, oh, there are all these clubs where people liked opening up their radio kit and swatching, swapping out the, the cat thread detector and doing all this. And so, or like motorcycles, right? Repair, maintenance is part of the joy. It's the way the person uh, personally owns the item and adjusts it to themselves. And so they create a subculture in which they support that. They offer these parts, right? That's very different from today's like iPhone, where they're like, you touch it, you avoid the warranty, they're gonna design it so you can't even open it up without specialized tools, right? Um, and again, yeah, so, so there is this both a lore, and like I said, there could be a lot of frustration involved with items. I feel like I spend half my time updating software, maintaining everything, and it's not something I enjoy. So I think a lot of our experience with technology really has to do with this realm. And we won't learn as much if we only focus on the inventors. Um, and then I love this, the, the phrase learning curve actually got coined in the aircraft industry in the 1930s and 40s. What they studied was is that the engineers who designed an aircraft did not really know how it would react. Because with complex technologies that involve thousands of parts, they can't foresee how systems, all the pieces will interact. And so they uh, coined the term learning curve to figure out how over time, with the help of maintenance and engineers and, and repair people, you know, even like the Rosie Riveters and the, during World War II, women repair people and maintainers and builders, they're the ones who kind of figured out how to make the system work better. So invention isn't really, shouldn't be seen as a one-time moment, but like as a process that unfolds. So an example would be like an aircraft engine would be designed by Whitney, and they would you know, have something like a thousand hours of life before the machine would die. 
And then over the course of 10 years, it would be up to something like 10,000. We increased tenfold the reliability and the design. So, uh, so like I said, there's a lot to do with maintenance. I'll end on a couple points that I'm going to move really fastly through. Um, sorry. Uh, one is, so these are just all different kinds of perspectives. We're kind of a grab bag. But one is that um, just like technologies are physical and material, they also exist in particular places. And they, that matters. And so I sometimes try to pretend I'm a geographer and to talk to students about how to geographer look at technology. And so one example I used, um, Nicole Staroselsky's work, The Underseas Network. When most people imagine today's digital connected world, they imagine this kind of image. Mark Zuckerberg's always in front of a map like this, this world of infinite connections. But 90% of the traffic looks like this. 90% um, of your traffic goes through physical undersea fiber optic cables. And it's really interesting because they go along the same routes that the telegraph cables were developed in the 1870s and 80s. These are routes that were hammered out because of imperialism and because of actual ocean currents and animals that nest with cables and things like that. So, um, so there's this real physical infrastructure that shapes our world. Another example is Sprint, the um, telephone giant. That it's, a, it's a full name is the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, something I with a network and telegraph or something. But anyway, Sprint it ran all its telephone lines along railroad routes. Because they're the only people with right of way across vast swaths of America. So one of the things you'll notice is, or here in Iowa we now have data centers. Like, again, the digital world is not some ethereal world that transcends materiality. It actually exists in particular places that have water. In fact, a lot of the data storage centers are in the exact places that the Pony Express have their hubs, <laughs> because those are the places with water in the West. And so you see this kind of layering one on top of the other. And we could get into other discussions, too, about how geography shapes invention and stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah, reminded that it really was a material network, right? So here's an example of what early telegraph and electrical wiring looked like. Here's an example of when it went underground. Right, so we have a movement from a place that we can see on the street down below. And the effects of this were really large in all kinds of ways. My favorite example is that all of these wires is what allowed squirrels to populate cities. Uh, there's a lot of research done. Before this, animals like dogs would eat squirrels. Like, squirrels have their own little super highway above the ground. And so, so uh, which leads me into one of the things, the last things I'll talk about, the environmental impact. Like, because technologies are all material, because they exist in real places and times, they also have demands on the environment. Um, sometimes they can be interesting and surprising demands, like those squirrels that find new homes. Um, going back to the point of airplanes, uh, it's not any kind of wood that can be used. There's a particular kind of spruce that was the most popular, the Sitka spruce, which grows in the Pacific Northwest. <coughs> so all during World War I, they had to you know, lumber huge amounts of spruce to build Allied planes. And that would have huge effects on the environment. So, Often I'll tell students, like when they're doing their projects, if you find a technology, figure out what it's made of and try to trace, because that's part of the story of technology too. Um, when we shift to metals, we get into a lot of interesting stuff about the impact as far as extracting copper, smelting iron ores. Another example I always like is the telegraph cables. They were actually sealed with gutta percha, which is a kind of sap from a tree in Southeast Asia. Um, and you see this with um, uh, shellac, all these resins and later plastics, they come from particular places and they have impacts from the local environment. Um, it's not always a story of doom and gloom. I like to bring up the example of the Panavigio forest in northern Italy where Stradivarius made violins. This is a forest that has special kind of resonance wood, so wood with very even, very detailed grain that makes some of the best musical instruments in the world. But it, because of that value, it has like a 600 year tradition of cooperative management of the forest. So they've done it very sustainably. So I try not to say it's not always a tale of doom and gloom. Right? We can sometimes find really interesting. But either way, we should think about that as part of the story. And there's um, often what we use now. Uh, companies have what are called life cycle analysis. So of every any particular object, they kind of track out all the materials that go into it, and also where it goes in terms of being recycled, broken down, reused. Um, so for my students who are especially environmentally conscious, I think this is a really important thing that they can do when they study technologies. And then lastly, I just end on this note. Um, I said this, I think, in the first session, but technologies have many lives. And one is to go into disposal. One is to have sex be reborn as jewelry, as collector items. Here, someone's bent 
wrenches into hooks. So there's an endless array of, of you know, kind of trajectories in the life of any technology. Um, so in my class, the last project they do is to pick one artifact and they have to tell its life story, kind of from cradle to grave. Um, and I'm always surprised at what they find, uh, whatever they choose. So. Um, okay, so now I've run over time. Uh, Sorry, we won't be able to take questions, but uh, Mike, we thank you so much for this. And I'm going to open up. And thanks for your presentation. The Bucket Course Committee is presenting $50 to the Art Hyman Book Fund to buy more books for the library. So thank you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.